Gabor Mate is a famous physician, and I am a not famous tour guide. Gabor is Canadian and I'm Israeli. He has written a lot of best-selling books about trauma, and I've made a single movie about living in the forest for two years. Gabor Mate and I are very different, but we have one thing, one very important thing in common. We are both Jews. We are Jews who have very different opinions about Israel. I'm a Zionist, like the vast majority of Jews in Israel, and he is an anti-Zionist. Since the 7th of October attacks, which were the biggest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, Gabor Mate has been getting interviewed whenever and wherever he can, and he has been bashing Israel and Zionism every chance he gets. Now, surprise, surprise, I don't agree with him at all, but it took me a few minutes to understand what it was that was really annoying me about his interviews. It is not his opinions on Israel. He talks like any other Palestinian supporter, and in a few minutes I will be debunking his arguments that is enough. He doesn't even really have any arguments. In his interviews, he just keeps repeating one same argument over and over again, that Israel massacred the Palestinians in 1948. What really annoyed me is that he uses his Jewishness not to bring a new perspective to the situation, but only as a card to lay on the table. I am a Jew and I am a Holocaust survivor, so you'd better listen to me. And I've watched a few of his interviews with his daughter and with Russell Brand, and he uses the same pattern, the same trick, over and over again. In my political videos, I don't play on my identity for two reasons. The first, and the most important one, is that it is mostly irrelevant. I don't like identity politics. I see it as a sort of racism. Judge me on what I say not on my gender or my Jewishness on my skin color. And second, if you bring your identity into the argument, it can also be used against you. Gabor Mate gets out the Jewish card and waves it about, but it doesn't have any meaning for him. The 7th of October attacks were the biggest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. And yes, I'm repeating this since it is very important to understand the dimensions of the attack. Horrific acts were perpetrated by the Palestinians. Gabor Mate lives in Canada, where the Jewish community was devastated, first by the Hamas atrocities, and then by the outburst of hatred and the attacks on synagogues, Jewish schools. Jews are hiding Jewish symbols, afraid to speak Hebrew on the streets, on, on public transportation, and in university. Suddenly, Jews living in Vancouver and Montreal are not just Canadians drinking their morning coffee, they are Jewish Canadians drinking their morning coffee. But Gabor doesn't care one bit about the Jewish community in his country. He doesn't mention it in any of his interviews. He says he isn't justifying the Hamas attack, but one sentence later, he is accusing Israel of massacres in 1948 as if that explains the 7th of October attacks. For someone who specializes in trauma, I would expect a bit more sympathy and less blaming, but it seems he just can't help himself. See how this interview starts. This is the first question that gets asked about the conflict. Uh, what is your overall assessment of, of where this war is now heading? For that, you need some historical context. Now, look, I used to be a Zionist. I'm a, as you mentioned, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Zionism was very important for me as a salvation of the Jewish people. Until I found out that the state was founded based on the extirpation, the expulsion, and multiple massacres of the local population. And that's not historically controversial. So Pierce asked where this war is heading. And what is Gabor's answer? That he is a Holocaust survivor and that you need to understand the past and that Israel was founded on exploitation and massacres and that that isn't historically controversial. What is he talking about? First, 
you being a Holocaust survivor has nothing to do with the question. It doesn't add anything. And most Holocaust survivors are pro-Israel. So you know, what is your point? Second, you can refer to the past to explain the future, but to say that Israel was founded on exploitation and massacres and that that isn't historically controversial, actually, it really is controversial. He is completely wrong. Gabor, name one Jewish village that was built on stolen Arab land before November 1947. That is when the UN said, let's do the logical thing and divide the land into a Jewish land and an Arab land. The Jews said yes to the partition plan and the Arabs said no. They started killing Jewish civilians and eventually lost the war that they had started. Now, that is not controversial. In the War of Independence, 1% of the Jewish population was killed and a third of them were civilians. Now, I'm saying that the Arabs massacred the Jews and he's saying that the Jews massacred the Arabs. Who is right? How can you, how can you tell? Here is an interesting fact that Gabor doesn't mention. How many Arabs continue to live in the Jewish area after the war ended in 1949? 160,000 Arabs carried on living in the state of Israel and became Israeli citizens. Now, how many Jews carried on living in the Arab areas? Zero. Not one single Jew was left alive if caught by the Palestinians. He accuses Israel of many crimes and then says, The land that's been stolen from the Palestinians. I'm not talking about the state of Israel. I'm not talking about 1948. I'm talking about since 67 and what's going on right now. That he actually said this is unbelievable because Israel has already done exactly what he suggests. Perhaps the majority of the viewers didn't understand it and maybe even Pierce didn't understand it. And I think that Gabor didn't actually realize what he had said. 1967 is the year of the Sixth Day War when Israel conquered the Gaza Strip. In 2005, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip and withdrew to the borders it had before 1967. So 18 years ago, Israel did exactly what Gabor suggested. And it didn't prevent the October 7th attack. And it didn't bring about peace. Hamas doesn't act the way it acts because of the collective trauma that the Palestinians experienced in 1948. Gabor, look at the Jews. They experienced a collective trauma in 1944. And yet, Jews don't go around killing Germans in Berlin. Not today and not 60 years ago. Hamas acts the way it acts because violence is one of its key values. It is not just me saying it. They say it about themselves in their constitution. Gabor speaks in a soft voice. And you can see that he's a very sensitive man. I'm sure that he is a sensitive man and he is not faking it. And listening to him, it is very easy to sympathize with him and his personal stories. But I must say, and you said throughout the whole interview, that for someone who is a trauma expert and supposed to be a good listener, he does talk quite a lot about himself and his experiences, even though that has very little to do with what Pierce is asking him. Gabor doesn't answer the questions. Pierce asks again, what should Israel do about Hamas? And Gabor doesn't answer him and instead start talking about being Canadian and how terribly the native population of Canada was treated. Nobody thinks this is right. But at the same time, I think many would share my view that Israel has a right to defend itself. The question is, how do they do that appropriately? And how do they get rid of Hamas? If indeed you think they shouldn't get rid of Hamas. Well, you're raising many questions and many fair questions. Well, look, I live in Canada, where this country was founded on the suppression and the erasure of the indigenous population and the utter denial of that narrative. And uh, in Canada, for example, there were horrendous residential schools where a few decades ago, if a native child spoke their tribal language, they'd have a pen stuck in their tongue. Now, most Canadians are not aware of that history. Most Israelis are not aware of the history of what the Palestinians have suffered. They don't know that in 1948, there were multiple massacres 
of large numbers of people by Israeli forces. They don't know the history, the subjective experience of the Palestinians. I find it interesting that he accuses the Canadians of not understanding how badly they treating the local inhabitants. And three times he says that the Israelis are doing the same to the Palestinians. And he knows better than Israelis because he has been to Israel three times. Most, or at least a very large number of Israelis, have been to Judea and Samaria, which is the historical and correct name of the West Bank, more than three times, without claiming to be experts on the area. There are two interesting points to make here. The first is that, like many pro-Palestinians, those who are against Israel are also against the West. Hamas is not only anti-Israel, but also wants to Muslimize the world. So again, no surprise there. But second, the idea of comparing the indigenous people of Canada and the Palestinian is at best intellectual laziness. You take what you know from your own history and apply it to a totally different situation. Let me explain. So in Canada, the US and South America, there were the indigenous people all living in one continent. And then the Europeans came, the Spanish, the French, the British, and they took their land. You can't say that about the land of Israel. In many of my videos, I have said that 100 years ago, there were no Palestinian people. And this is of course 100% right, but there is a deeper, way bigger story here. The land of Israel is a geographical corridor connecting Africa and Asia in Europe, and it is also a historical corridor. In 1799, Napoleon conquered the land of Israel. Does that mean it belongs to the French? In 1260, the grandson of Genghis Khan conquered the land of Israel. Does that mean it belongs to the Mongols? In 1187, Saladin conquered the land of Israel. Does that mean it belongs to the courts? I can go back another 2,000 years to Alexander the Great and the Romans and the Jews and the Egyptians and the great empires of the East. I can talk about the special connection of the Jews to the land of Israel, which is greater than the connection of any other people to the land of Israel. But the main point I want to make here is that to compare the indigenous people of the Americas and the colonialism over there to the history of the land of Israel is actually a lazy and patronizing way of thinking. You take your history and you bend other people's history to make it fit the one model you know. Throughout the interview, Gabor doesn't listen to Pierce. He just goes on and on talking about himself and saying the same few things. So let me just say a quick word about Pierce. I think he's a good interviewer and he is not afraid to say what he thinks, even if it doesn't comply with the rules of political correctness. He has done a lot of different interviews, some with the pro-Israelis, some with pro-Palestinians, and I think that he's pretty fair, but he also made one stupid comment. I mean, the mere fact that Israel was able, after October the 7th, to simply turn off the supplies of food and water and fuel and so on into Gaza, says it all. That, that is a, an occupation, that is a controlling force, controlling whether people eat or have fuel or can heat themselves or feed themselves. There are two crucial points here that most people don't consider. Israel is accused of turning Gaza into a prison, but the Gaza Strip also has a border with Egypt, a border that is not controlled by Israel. If Germany closes the border with the Netherlands, does the Netherlands then become a prison? No as it also has a border with Belgium. It's the same here. If the Arab and Muslim world really cared so much about the poor Palestinians, they could send them support through Egypt. It is that simple. Why is nobody talking about it? Gaza and Egypt share a border. They can just open it and help the Palestinians, but they don't do that. And the Muslim world and the Western world is completely silent about it. Now let me solve this mystery. The Egyptians, the Arab world, the Muslim world, and the so-called pro-Palestinians aren't really all that bothered about the Palestinians. They are just anti-Israel. The Palestinians are just the peasants that the Iranians and part of the Muslim world are playing with. So the world come to Israel with a demand to help the Palestinians. 
This is absolutely crazy. Did the British supply fuel and food to the Germans in World War II? Did the Americans provide humanitarian aid to the Japanese in 1943? And this is what Pierce get terribly wrong. The fact that Israel supplies aid to Gaza is not proof of how deep the occupation is, but rather an example of how honorable the Israelis are. It is madness to suggest that Israel should take care of the Palestinians. And by the way, half of the people in Gaza are Egyptians, and the Egyptians don't lift a finger for them. The Arab world literally sits in a room next to the room called Gaza, with a door between them, and the Arab world is like, there is a door here and they need our help on the other side. We can open the door and help them, or we can go into the living room with all the other Arab countries and condemn Israel. Yeah, let's do that. In the interests of fairness, I will leave links to the interviews with Gabor Mater here below, so you can see if you agree with me or with him. But I will also leave a link to a much more interesting video, my movie about living in the forest for two years. It is in Hebrew, but it has subtitles. As always, thank you to all my coffee supporters. You really keep me going. See you next week. Yalla bye.